So, welcome. I'm Dr. Mairead Nicolavi Heal from Dublin City University, and we're here today to talk about a primer. It's a webinar being delivered on behalf of Eden, um, and we have some great panelists with us today. I'm delighted to be here. And this is a primer to help people and to, for those of you who are joining in today with respect to implementing and engaging with micro-credentials. We've got a really, really, really good panel put together. They're people who have a vast amount of experience in, in implementation, in policy, and in thinking about the theoretical and in the abstract with respect to micro-credentials and other forms of learning. And so I'm delighted to introduce them. Um, and I'm also going to apologize to you all because I have a very severe cold. So I will be turning off my mic quite a bit and I hopefully won't uh, be coughing too much on it. But no COVID, just a cold. And you're very, very welcome. And a big thank you to Sandra as well and to the Eden Secretariat for supporting us. So quick introduction to our panelists. Um, we have Professor Rebecca Ferguson um, from the Open University. And Rebecca, if you'd like to say a few words about yourself. Oh, right. Thanks, Mairead. Uh, yes, I'm uh, based at the Open University, where I've been the academic lead on micro-credentials for a couple of years. I've also co-authored five micro-credentials. I've studied one to completion, and I've been involved in the evaluation of our micro-credential programme. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Uh, uh, Deborah Arnold from Angers, France. Onege. Oh, Onege. Oh, Onege. Oh, Onege. Oh, <laughs> we'll work on that French accent while you're Oh, no. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Deborah Arnold. So I'm a project coordinator um, at Onege, which is the French Digital University for Management and Economics. Uh, we're a member association. We're not um, a university ourselves, so we support our members in um, uh, pedagogical innovation, anything to do with uh, with digital. And in that capacity, I coordinate a project under Erasmus+, Plus, which is called ECHO, the European Credential Clearinghouse for Opening Up Education. And I'll be telling you a bit more about what we're doing there. So when we talk about micro-credentials or digital credentials in ECHO, we're interested in the object, the digital certificate that attests to the competences. And this is an interesting conversation I think we can have about the language we're all using mm -hmm. and what um, what we mean when we say micro-credentials. That's all for me for now. Thanks very much, Deborah. So moving on to Ulf, Daniel Ellers, and hopefully my German pronunciation, Professor Ulf, Daniel Ellers is better than my French. Well, yeah, uh, it's quite good, actually. My name, at least, uh, is much, much uh, better than the usual Italian or French pronunciation. <laughs> it's Ulf or Ulf. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a bit about um, yourself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm based in the south of Germany here. Um, I'm a professor for education. Um, education management and lifelong learning is my uh, denomination, how we say here. Um, I, I'm running an institute which is called Next Education, and we do um, studies, research, and also teaching. Uh, in the field of uh, future higher education, digital transformation on, of higher education, of learning and of organizational processes. That's our, our interest. Um, on micro-credentials, I have been focusing in the past uh, because the big question is, are micro-credentials the key we need to unlock the flexibility which our students apparently, apparently might need in the future uh, when they are not any longer studying in beginning their study in university one and ending their study in university one, but when there's a lot of, lot of flexibility and mobility uh, around possible. And we have defined um, in several studies scenarios for the future of higher education. That's what I want to contribute also today a little bit more. Okay, thanks very much to the panelists. And just a brief interview um, or a brief overview of myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Mairead Nicola V. Heal. I'm Director of Micro Credential Strategy and Innovation here in Dublin City University. I am head of what we call DCU Studio. I'm part of the role of that, it's the rollout of micro credentials and implementation. I'm also a member of um, the MC2 project, which is a national project run in Ireland for the development of a national platform for micro-credentials. And that's funded through our 
heart that's funded through the HCI or the Human Capital Initiative here, the National Training Fund. So micro credentials is very much part of the DNA of what we're doing in Ireland at the minute. And also DCU is part of the ECIU University Alliance. And we work closely in and in, in the DCU on the work package with some of our colleagues for implementing micro credentials, as that is the approach that we're taking as part of the alliance. So we have a huge amount of experience in developing out and understanding what micro credentials are. So what we really wanted to do today in this sort of a primer is to talk to the panelists and to moderate from, from my own perspectives on what, how and what micro credentials. So really as a primer, really get Getting to grips with the key questions that we've all dealt with when we've been dealing with micro credentials. So I think just as a quick sort of opener, and Rebecca, I'll start with yourself. What would you say are the top three affordances of micro credentials? What are they really delivering for learners from learners in the first instance? Uh, what we'd say at the Open University, and I know that people's uh, perspectives are going to be different. Um, we see them as offering opportunities to upskill and reskill uh, without committing to three or more years of study, which is what you'd normally have to do at a university. Um, instead, you can commit to a 10 week course, a 12 week course, and you can come out of that with uh, professional skills, work related skills, and also with some academic credit. Um, We'd see an important aspect as being you can study alongside work responsibilities and all the, your caring responsibilities. Um, now, at the Open University, we're a distance university anyway, so most of our students are doing that. But we know a lot of our students struggle to do that for long periods of time. So the opportunities to do that for um, you know three or four months is, is something that's very welcome. And we also see an important thing as you can apply your knowledge immediately in your work environment. And we see a lot of our micro credential learners. We've got about 1500 at the moment um, coming into uh, discussions and saying, oh, it was really interesting what I learned last week. And I've tried that out immediately and I'm passing it on to colleagues. Um, so I'd say those are the top three differences we're seeing. Deborah, do you see other affordances that you have noticed in your what you the work you've been doing? Um, looking at it again from the point of view of the the, the, the micro credential as the the artifact, uh, which I think is a is a is a complementary approach to looking at it as the learning opportunity uh, itself. Um, detailed record of learning achievements. Um, and I think this links into um, the, the ongoing trends, which we see um, in, in, in France in particular, because this is where I, I live and, and work. Um, within higher education, there is a move away from uh, describing uh, diplomas in terms of knowledge to describing them in terms of competences, aligning those with um, uh, national and European frameworks and uh, competency frameworks. Uh, and therefore, um, once you actually have that, uh, that, that record of learning achievements in, in a form that is compatible uh, across, across Europe and hopefully beyond, um, then it's much more meaningful than um, just a paper certificate, or it should be much more valuable than um, a certificate with the nice university seal and stamp on it. Um, and then that leads to another affordance, which is the question of trust and transparency. When you've got everything detailed, when, um, when it's transparent about who has issued the credential, who has stamped it, who has validated it, the quality assurance processes that have gone into um, it, its recognition, then um, I think there's, there's this huge potential there um, to support the kind of mobility and flexibility that, that Ulf mentioned earlier. And Ulf, I suppose from your perspective of it, do you see micro-credentials having a specific frame around competency and future skills or is it particularly focused on those types of areas? I think um, 
most of the the let's say the visions have been already put on the table now but of course it depends what a micro credential is actually you know in the best of cases a micro credential is like a small digital certification which you receive which is credible which is stackable which you can connect to other learning experiences and qualifications which you can carry around portable also and others understand it they can recognize it it's recognizable and so on and you really record in there your experience and your competencies it's really a record and it's in a way contributing to your portfolio of what you can show to other people it's not just that you have a bachelor in economics but you so to speak have a collection which you can bring to the table when you go for example to an employer or when you um when you are going to another university and they want to know how can we use what you have learned before in the next step which you want to make so i i think if we let's say take this this vision of micro credentials then they have a lot of affordances they allow the my curriculum approach you know i can mm. i can choose what i'm 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 interested in because um, I can become the the owner of my own episode of learning, and I can be the manager and the curator of of this episode of learning with the course which I take from the next institution. And both credentials which I receive make up the portfolio of what is maybe then a larger, a sense, a meaningful uh, chunk of 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 learning. Uh, with which I, what what Rebecca said, I'm upskilling myself. For example, if if I have uh, a certain uh, upskill tasks to do, so um, yeah, I I, I I I would just like to frame it like that and not repeat what the others uh, have said. One one affordance which I think, if you if you think in terms of a larger scenario, of course, it's uh, giving autonomy from an institution to uh, from uh, giving giving the 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 control so to speak from from the institution to to the learner in in the end of the day he or she is the person the the actor which has to take care so to speak then uh, in the end and he or she will use this micro credential collection which they receive from the higher education institution in our case mm -hmm. Um, for being mobile in 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 the labor market or in society. And one last point, maybe um, we we are involved in in the current largest study on um, blockchain skills, uh, and we yeah. have surveyed um, in this very you know high tech sophisticated sector, um, uh, big companies, small companies across seventeen countries of Europe. And and basically, bottom line is that they all say um, there is no higher education program which we can you know recommend to our to our employees to upskill them. They really need micro credentials. They need short courses, chunks, pieces okay. which they can bundle together. There is nothing available right now. There's just one higher education degree program which is focusing on that in Europe, at least what we found. And that's not, not enough for this growing sector. So that's also an, an affordance for this very forefront risky areas in which uh, people want to put a foot and um, uh, want to want to work and want to be skilled. And from just to build, I suppose, on that point, and you know, one of the so-called affordances or the it's bandied around the literature is the connection between micro credentials and industry. And as you said there, you know, there's that effort or that requirement by industry to have certified learning in very niche and specific areas. Does that bring particular challenges, though, as well for higher education institutions? Because at the end of the day, are we will we end up to be an on-demand service providers for very specific niche learning opportunities through micro-credentials? Or could that under I suppose could that endanger? the integrity of micro-credentials micro and wider credentials. And I presume that comes back to this, you know, my next question to you was the challenges. You spoke a little bit about some of the portability and stackability and getting the envelope right, as we spoke about, and being able to recognize learning. 
my question is, is that are we tr- if we're trying to do something a little bit different uh, about micro credentials, we have to get all of the structure things right, obviously. But I think we have to get the learning design and the connection out to industry as well. We have to work on those relationships as well. So maybe, Rebecca, you might have a little think about that and respond. Yeah, so I think I'm, I'm going to come at it from a sort of learning um, uh, course perspective again. So uh, what Ulf was was talking about there was uh, was the learner as a sort of manager and co-creator of their own learning. Um, one of the things that we have found, um, and this is in micro credentials and previously in in massive open online courses, the MOOCs, is that not all our learners have the skills necessary to do that straight away. Now, one of the things about micro credentials, which is quite unusual is is they are primarily an online um, approach um, at the moment they they don't necessarily need to be although if we're talking about digital credentialing um, probably they, they will do in the long run but they're mainly online and a lot of our learners don't have the skills necessary to study online they they're used to studying face to face and they haven't developed that skill set and they don't necessarily have the self regulation skills um things like being able to set a realistic goal being able to set themselves the steps towards that goal the time management skills the reflection skills um now that that is no attack on our learners uh, those are things that in most uh, edu- uh, education environments, especially up to university level, uh, have been taken on by the teachers. But in an online setting, in a micro-credential setting, they're going to have to take responsibility for those. So to some extent, we have to um, build into our micro-credentials that skill set so that our learners not only learn the skills and the competencies but they learn how to learn and they can take that to to other micro credentials so i think that's something very important um, another challenge we've we've encountered is is the thing about international reach now international reach uh, has very very positive aspects um, you know it brings together lots of perspectives it opens up um, these these courses connects people um, But it does mean that we're writing for an international audience who may not be studying in their first language. Um, In a lot of cases, who are finding micro-credentials really expensive. Now, when we say that, we sometimes think about people in Africa or parts of Asia. But actually, in parts of Europe, where um, people are used to the fact that the government usually pays for your courses, and suddenly they're being asked to pay for the course, um, so we see that, for example, within the UK, uh, that our, our Scottish students and our Welsh students aren't having to pay very much. Our English students are having to pay a huge amount. Um, so some people are finding it expensive, some aren't. Um, and we're also finding that people have different understandings of the terms which are used in a course produced by a university. So some of those are things like discuss and explain. Um, but one of the key things we're seeing is understandings of plagiarism, which, of course, we know is, is understood differently around the world. And um, coping with cases which in, in our normal context, we'd say, oh, this is academic misconduct. But in these cases, we're saying, well, actually, it's probably just a misunderstanding about what is acceptable and what is good practice and what is bad practice. So those are some of the international issues that we've been encountering. And we've also been encountering the, the sort of um, clash between a skills based professional curriculum and uh, the association with academic credit, um, because one of the points that people have made is you can get both together. But if people are getting academic credit, if they are studying with a university for academic credit, then should they be able to access the entire offering of that university? And if you think about the offering of your university, it, for example, might have um, 
employment advice. It might have counselling. It might have access to a huge online library. Lots of things that when you put them together are quite a valuable offering, which you might not be able to afford to offer to students who are only with you for three months. So that's a summary of some of the, 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 the uh, challenges, challenges we've been meeting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I think some of the ones that you have, they're, they're reflective of what we know about international education anyway. Do you know that type of way yeah, and what we've, yes. had to, we've had to learn? I think the tension there with industry is an important one. One of the questions that's come in for the Q&A, and I might get the panellists to respond. In Sweden, you're able to sign up for standalone courses, campus or online with clear learning outcomes, examinations. And if successful learners are rewarded, ECTS as small as one. Would you consider this as a micro-credential? Deborah, what do you think? Oh, sorry, could you repeat that, please? <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So oh, I, can, I can have a look at the Q&A myself. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're able to sign up for a standalone course, campus or online with a clear learning outcome, examinations, and if successful, learners are awarded ECTS, as small as one ECTS. Would you consider this as a micro-credential? Um, a simple answer would be yes. Um, I know that there are different um, definitions of uh, micro-credentials in terms of volume and learning, but if you look at it from um, the point of view of the definition of a detailed record of learning achievements, um, if the learning outcomes are clear, if the... Um, assessment and evaluation practices are clear um, and, and recorded in that digital record, then absolutely. Um, for me, that is um, a micro-credential. And if you look at um, the different definitions which are circulating at the moment, um, uh, I've got both the definition from um, uh, Beverly Oliver, who did a lot of work for, uh, who's doing a lot of work for um, uh, UNESCO on this, um, a micro-credential is a record of focused learning achievement, verifying what the learner knows, understands or can do, includes assessment based on clearly defined standards and is awarded by a trusted provider, has standalone value and may also contribute or complement other micro-credentials or macro-credentials, including through recognition of prior learning and meets the standards required by relevant quality assurance. So if those fit what is being practiced in uh, in Sweden, then my answer would be yes there on that basis. Okay, Ulf, would you agree? Your mic. Um, sorry, I would agree as well. Um, uh, totally that this would be, in my understanding, representing a micro-credential, uh, of course. One issue which, which we have to consider, of course, is that um, one ECTS is a very, very small, small micro-credential. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nano-credential. <laughs> quite, quite small. When we discussed micro-credential uh, definition um, in, in various project contexts or also in the task force of, of the commission, we were often thinking that, that the micro-credential can well also have uh, several ECTS up to five or ten or so, or even more, but below a bachelor, of course. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting because in Ireland, we would say that uh, our quality, our quality assurance, so uh, quality and Assurance in Ireland would our main association, they would say that we already have micro credentials and they run up to 30 credits. So, you know, it's it's very interesting how different how different areas are dealing with it and think about micro credentials. So it's not about just the minimum. And for me, if you talk to a lot of industry, industry will say, well, 25 hours of learning is quite a significant amount of time to spend learning about something. So I suppose it depends what perspective you're looking from as well. Deborah, coming back to, to you on the challenges that you see with micro-credentials, what would they be? Ah, lots and lots and lots. Um, 
<laughs> Looking at it from, um, I mean, it, I think it's it's nice that we're, uh, we're the three of us are very very complementary here, uh, and and Rebecca and and all focusing um, on uh, the 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 learner perspective. Um, I'd like to flip that and have a look at it um, as well from the. Um, at uh, the institutional side, although Rebecca did say as well that one of the challenges was can we actually afford to offer all of these to, to our students? Um, first of all, I think asking the big question of um, why are we doing micro-credentials in the first place? Um, to quote somebody that uh, uh, you know well, uh, Marie, that many of us do, a certain Mark Brown from uh, DCU as well, who often says, what is the problem that micro-credentials are trying to solve? I just shared in the, the chat as well a link to um, a, a document that we produced at the uh, Eden Annual Conference this year. Um, Asking that that difficult question of, of um, does does micro credentialing actually take something away from what we believe higher education should be? Um, there's a lot of arguments about no higher education needs to continue to um, uh, produce these well-rounded graduates with a, a, a full um, uh, set of competences, and we can't possibly. Uh, break those down into uh, into chunks of of learning, and I know that criticism is out there. Um, so, and I, but I think it it does depend on um, uh, particular situations and contexts, and then you've got to look at those affordances, and you've got to look at um, uh, what learners and society actually need and want. Perhaps. The answer is somewhere in the middle that there is a place for both and that micro credential credentials won't be replacing um, the whole of higher education. Um, so let's assume that we have decided that micro credentials are a good idea um, and that they are valuable to institutions and to learners um, and to industry and society as well. Um, if we look at it from the institutional side, then um, the good old institutional um, inertia uh, is a particular challenge. Um, and I think relating that to um, um, uh, to actually thinking about competences when you're designing a program. Now, certain countries, certain institutions and organizations might be a lot further down the line, but this was the conversation that I had for two and a half hours with French colleagues earlier today um, when we were talking about competency-based approaches and micro-credentials. Um, and a lot of the people in the working group said, well, we still haven't managed to convince our colleagues um, to stop describing our courses in terms of knowledge and to start describing them in competences. And what does that mean? And how do we have the time to do this? And it's more than just an administrative constraint or a, a, a legal constraint because the French ministry now obliges us to do that. So it's developing that competency mindset around what are traditionally academic subjects. Um, so that's on the academic side, on the administrative and technical side, how do we fit micro-credentials into our information system? Our information system delivers diplomas based on the information that we put in on a particular course and not a particular organization around competences. We don't have micro-credentials in the information system yet. Um, uh, so again, that's, that's a, a, another challenge. And um, our conclusion from the working group this afternoon was that we really need to get everybody around the table um, at some point, but probably do that progressively as well so that uh, we're um, looking at particular concerns of particular groups of people and then get them around the table to 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 resolve these. Yeah. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, lots of institutional challenges. I think some of those challenges will be for any new types of offerings that would come through anyway, but I think the frame that you put with respect to competencies and changing that mindset is interesting. One of the things I wanted to come back to Ulf about was looking at, you know, this notion, I suppose, of we're in this world and we're talking from a higher education perspective, but there is a whole plethora of micro-credentials being delivered out there or being called micro-credentials by industry. Is there a tension there between us and one of the questions that has come through the chat, can we work out the standards definition, what are the relationships between this that 
we'll do all of that, I presume, in Europe. We're going to do a lot of work on micro-credentials. But is there still going to be a massive, massive other other side or other sort of provision of micro-credentials where there'll be very limited or limited control on them? Yeah, I think there is actually. And when we did our interviews for the study I just mentioned on the blockchain sector, there was uh, uh, an entirely disconnected sphere of micro-credentials, which the people talked about. But they were they were not very afraid of that. They were just saying, you know, um, uh, since there are no higher education certifications from for which we are looking uh, for, um, uh, that's not a big problem. We are we, we are happy if people bring badges and uh, from from things they have done somewhere uh, and um, from experience they had somewhere, and then they 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 tell us and we will listen to it, and then that that works as well. So I think that that um, this kind of disconnect um, uh, is is a process which we have to recognize in in a way. Um, and it asks it, 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 this kind of disconnect asks questions. <laughs> it it brings up questions um, which you can ask in both directions. Are we fit as higher education institutions to serve this need? Um, or the other direction would be to ask: Is this process we can see there um, a dangerous process to society, undermining social equality? <laughs> <laughs> as everybody, even those people with not a lot of money for paying for for for, for some kind of further education, the the same the same um, um, chances or, or potentials to to uh, access this kind of of credentials as well. So so I think this is something we we really need to observe, um, and we need to. In my feeling, that's that's why I am uh, getting up every morning. <laughs> to work in my feeling we need to make higher education fit to really um, live up to the to the to the task to the challenge because our society is demanding different kinds of qualifications is demanding often more flexible pathways between different um, education sectors um, and is demanding, um, not big, but small chunks. Uh, and I, I can tell you, I, I'm amazed, Rebecca, what, what you're telling about, about um, your university, because um, I've just pulled up some, some data from, from Germany, and we have 426 universities in Germany. And um, out of them, I think we have like below 100, which are starting to experiment with micro-credentials. And some uh, small pockets of their um, their activities, um, and and I just saw in the chat that in Sweden, uh, how how the person I don't know who it was uh, expressed uh, himself or herself, the standard size of a micro credential in Sweden is between five and ten ECTS. I wouldn't know if we have a standard size in Germany. To be honest, <laughs> um, I think it's a big big discussion. And people are between this idea of clinging to what we have, which is short courses, um, which is further education, academic further education, short courses. Um, and sometimes universities open up to industry or to other target groups and providing um, something, something shorter than bachelor and master degrees. Um, uh, this this is what we have, and and people people are, are between this, you know, uh, this this belief of um, are micro credentials actually that what we know already, you know, or are they something different? And if they are something different, what what on earth do we need now? Do we need new quality assurance agencies or processes or or so? Okay, so 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 this is the situation in my view. I mean. Uh, Maybe you know um, higher education is always a, a big choir of people um, analyzing it, but that's that's the situation. In my book. I, I would like to make make one more point, and that is um, uh, a little 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 question mark um, holding up a little question mark, and that is this issue of competencies. Um, um, you know, when when 
one one potential this whole development has is to talk again re in a reinforced in a deeper way about um, assessing competencies um, but it's it's really difficult to talk about a competence if um, a learner is doing some quizzes uh, after uh, 12 hours of learning uh, and then you know certifying that this learner has a competence competence defined as the ability to to act in an unknown, complex, problematic future situation in your field of, of a profession. Um, so so uh, there is also a danger that we are calibrating down our ambitions, which we had so far, into very, very small chunks, and we are losing, losing cohesion. Cohesion and consistency, that's the, the big issues with micro-credentials. Uh, I think we need to be taking um, good attention that um, we are not um, going down this road of, of um, um, what you just mentioned, Myrit, when you said there is a danger that we are just selling out what we did so far in a cheaper and uh, smaller way to 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 what actually to <laughs> to not to what so so that's also a danger. Okay, thanks very much, Ulf. Deborah, I know you're very much into the competency-based area as well. Is there anything you'd like to maybe to respond to what Ulf has said? Sorry. Um, I think Ulf has, has, has put it really, really well. Um, and it comes back to this question of how we assess competences. I mean, it, it, it really... Um, uh, makes us ask the question: Well, what are we asking the learners to do to prove that they have actually that they demonstrate that that competency? And when you look at a lot of assessment, I mean, Ulf mentioned um, uh, quizzes. Uh, we could even think of the traditional three-hour exam in a massive hall, um, which tests recall, um, short-term memory. But how do you actually? Um, uh, attest that uh, a particular learner has has demonstrated a particular competences. There's all the work about our portfolios, um, proof of um, uh, of learning, proof. Uh, but if we're going down the road of um, authentic assessment for everybody who wants to take a micro credential because they have to do that so that uh, um, that they would that an institution would deliver that micro-credential, um, then that's a whole other question. And it's a whole other business model as well for uh, uh, for, for universities. Um, again, I don't have the answer, but I agree with all that. We have to be very, very careful um, um, about what we are promising um, with these, with these micro-credentials. And, and I don't think that we've got to the bottom of it yet. Um, uh, it's a fascinating area to be working on, especially when you're looking at um, uh, soft skills and transversal skills, uh, which I've been doing for quite some time now across the LN projects. Um, and uh, peer assessment is a very, very good way, but then you have to design peer assessment as well. Uh, solidly, as, uh, as 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 many of us as many of us know, with with the right guidance um, to uh, the learners who were who were doing that. So um, uh, yeah, definitely something to be very very careful of uh, when we say that a particular student has a particular competence. What have we done to um, assess and uh, and justify that? And I suppose coming from the assessment part of it, and I know Rebecca, you you have a an interest in this as well the quality aspect and the quality of micro credentials who's checking that out and how should we do it institutionally in all of our institutions we have quite heavy frameworks for assuring quality of learning of of, of our learning offerings and i think potentially i always go back to a podcast and to some pre presentations i listened to from maria kello the director of the ENQA, and she said, we should have enough within our institutions. We have enough quality assurance in order to deal with these. We shouldn't be bringing in more layers within our institutions. 
Is there anything else, Rebecca, from the quality side of it that you would like to see brought in about for micro credentials? I don't think it's a question of, of what is brought in. I think it's a question of thinking about the implications of it. So uh, you can say, OK, uh, we're starting off with 300 hour courses, uh, which is which is uh, typically what. Uh, one of the smaller courses the OU would be let's let's cut it down let's cut it down to 100 hours let's cut it down to 50 hours let's cut it down to 10 hours but some of the things involved in the quality there make it very uneconomic to do that because for example you have got to verify that that student doing that work is that student you've got to have some way of doing that um, and as you have more and more students doing smaller and smaller things, the cost of that per student per micro credential rises. You've then got to have um, somebody who is marking that work. They've got to be trained to mark that work. They've got to be trained to mark that work at the same level as other people are marking that work. Um, so when you're doing that for a fairly large course, you know, it's realistic to look at are all our markers doing the same thing? Um, are all the um, different course teams doing the same thing? Are all the faculties doing the same thing? Um, is our university doing the same as other universities? Are the universities in our country doing the same as other universities? Right? There, there are lots and lots of checks that go on. Now, to do that for something very small is completely uneconomic. So then you have to start thinking, well, which of those things do I want to cut out? And every time you cut something out, you're potentially reducing the quality of it and you're reducing its um, validity when you take it to somebody else. So I would say those are some of the things which are a problem. And another thing which is a problem is people quite often talk about micro-credentials in terms of stackability. Yeah. So the idea is that you can do, you know, one, two, 10, 20 micro credentials and you can put them together and you can make something bigger. Um, but if you're going to do that, you've got to bear in mind the quality standards of the thing which is bigger. So if you're going to build up for a degree or a postgraduate certificate, you've got to go along with all the quality standards which are in place already which will say something like there's a set of graduate skills that they've got to demonstrate across those. Um, they've got to say you've got to see some sort of progression. Now, if, you're, if your learners are doing micro-credentials in any order, it's very difficult to demonstrate progression. If they're coming in without um, the skills to learn online and you don't know which order they're doing it in, you're having to keep reteaching those skills or you're having to say you've definitely got to do this course first, which shows you how to do it. Um, so these things aren't impossible, but they are very challenging. And I think quite often people who've been involved in producing courses haven't necessarily had to think about the economics of the university um, quality assuring. And we're now being forced to go and talk to the quality assurance teams and think about that. It's a scaling issue, though, as well, isn't it? As mm. well, because you have to get to a tipping point where it makes sense for the university to, um, as well. Ulf, I know that you have done a lot of work with industry. And I think, could you give us sort of where they're at, you know, looking at micro credentials? Do they, are they looking to higher education are they looking to education and training or are they going to start looking elsewhere if we don't get our act in order with well, respect to micro credentials it's, it's um it's a it's a difficult question it's not so easy to answer because um when when you go to industry um the hr people tell you that there is a lot of need for learning, first of all. The question is, who can help them with this? Um, and um, they feel more and more that the learning revolution of today and of the future will actually lead to a learning in which the learner, the employee, the member of an organization 
um, has to take more and more the role of the driver, has to take more and more autonomy. And um, that leads to a situation in which um, currently there is a, um, a feeling of helplessness because um, autonomy in learning can only um, become reality if an organizational culture is developed for that. And many organizations are just in this transformation process now where they are saying, we are coming from a, from a, from a situation in which we worked with universities, which were pro pro providing programs to our employees or with um, education and training um, um, uh, institutions, which were providing training offers to our employees. Um, we are coming from this and now we realize that this is even if we even uh, if we had tried to make it flexible it's too inflexible it's too inflexible the, the we we cannot any longer think for our employers what they will need they they need to, they will need to do that themselves and so they they th that's really what the what the next steps is about and uh, that means the real challenge currently is to work on supporting um, members of organizations, employers, uh, um, uh, employees, and, and so on, to, to support them, to, to coach them, to, to mentor them into um, embracing this autonomy, into being able of, um, so to speak, exercising this autonomy for, for, for themselves. And when it comes to micro-credentials, what is really an issue is that um, micro-credentials from, from its conceptual um, frame um, demand that, um, that the learners are the one who design the context around it, the larger context around it, for, which they, for what they need it, um, uh, where it fits, uh, what will follow from this micro-credentials, what is a good, um, so to speak, a, a base for taking this micro-credential in, in, in my past. Um, and that is exactly this. This is exactly the same thing which I just, just described when I talked about autonomy. So what is the current situation is a situation in which employers would say, um, we need people who are able to be so flexible, so autonomous, and so self-organized in their learning, uh, but we don't have them uh, in, in that amount which we, which, we, which we want and which we think it's meaningful. So we need to support them. And at the same time, micro-credentials do also demand this kind of skill. They demand this kind of skill to be um, autonomous, to be flexible, to... And, and so this is something where I think um, uh, learners are not always there at this, at this position um, and organizations are not always there to, to embrace this and absorb this kind of um, autonomy which is coming there. And there's absolutely no use if you open um, um, uh, the, the, the micro-credential programs to your employees uh, uh, without having uh, an organizational culture in which they are able to develop. So, so that, that there's absolutely no use to do that. And this is also, I think, uh, uh, a breaking point. There. Very interesting, because well, I think that's something that uh, Beverly Oliver has also spoken about quite a bit, and she's spoken about lots of institutions and lots of organizations. They have a lot of work-based training and that they already currently do um, and she should speak to, you know, the necessity for companies to look inwards into their own organizational culture to understand, are they a learning organization? Do they support that? Do they support that learning ethos? Um, which is, it's an interesting point. For me, when we did the national study of employees and employers in Ireland on micro-credentials, we found one of the biggest issues was that there was an absence of knowledge. There was a huge need for raising awareness. There was a huge need for getting people to understand the basics of my, what a micro-credential was. So that comes back, I think, to points that both yourself, Rebecca and Deborah have then to say, what are the sort of the, 
the fundamentals of micro credentials, you know, and that notion of being able to learn to know, learning to learn and all of that type of stuff. So we found a huge part of it in Ireland, even though we have quite a bit of national funding investing in this across, I think, 26 variety of projects across the higher education sector, huge amount of money being placed into this. But we're actually finding the gap. There is still a huge knowledge gap. And we have massive amount of multinationals, massive organizations in the country, but there's still that gap in knowledge awareness and that knowledge raising that has to be done both from the employers and the employees. The bit I wanted to come around, and I know we have a, we have a few minutes left, and I want to take some of the questions that have come in. And Deborah, I'm not going to throw you in the deep end on this question, the second question that's come in in the QA from Monica. But I think this question is actually a quite interesting one because it comes back to the question that uh, that Rebecca had been talking about, the, fi the financing. And it talks to, you know, is it recognised, the public funding for micro-credentials? Micro There's specific eligibility requirements for part-time ed education for funded part-time through our core grant system in Ireland, so while there is some funding available, micro-credentials may not necessarily fall in this. Is this the case? Would that also be the case in France or is it more open that shorter courses or potentially micro-credentials will be publicly funded? Ah, well, thank you for that, Marie. I was actually looking at that question as well and I thought it'd be a nice one to answer um, seeing as uh, Belgium is, uh, is one of our neighbours. Um, and it also resonates with, again, with the conversation that I had with the uh, with the French working group this afternoon um, about this issue of public funding. Um, and it does seem as if this model of um, uh, public funding based on um, the number of students um, is 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 it's it's not. It's not disappearing, but it seems to be more and more at, at risk. And, and in French higher education, um, uh, particularly, uh, I was looking at the statistics yesterday and, and uh, um, as, as regards the increasing number of students and the decreasing number of, of academics and support staff, uh, it, it's putting um, organizations into, into a very difficult situation. Um, and uh, because our um, uh, digital university association supports management and economics faculties this was particularly of interest to those management and, and business schools internal to universities because there's a lot of competition from the private business schools um, uh, who are already offering micro credentials uh, so in fact the people in the French working group I would not generalize to the whole of French higher education but in our particular field actually saw this offering of micro credentials as an opportunity to generate more funding um, uh, uh, in the face of reduced public funding. Um, and given that there is this very strong drive uh, in France towards um, competency-based higher education, um, they didn't actually see that that was too much of a barrier to take the next leap and then to start um, envisaging um, pulling these together as uh, as a micro credential offering, most probably for that um, the lifelong learners rather than um, uh, learners in uh, initial education. Okay. And Rebecca, in the UK, has the has the funding regime there changed in any way in respect to support micro credentials, or is there ha are there any new initiatives that have come on? Uh, well, uh, the initiatives are different in the different parts of the UK. So we haven't really seen one in England, uh, but Northern Ireland has been really supportive of micro-credentials, very engaged with micro-credentials and has uh, sponsored you know, hundreds of free uh, places. I mean, not just on our micro-credentials, but on other micro-credentials. Uh, we're also seeing that in Scotland um, Scotland very tied up with this, the skills agenda and also they're um, engaging. Uh, we've also seen um, individual employers and institutions who have been willing to fund 
their uh, employees uh, to come into micro credentials en masse. Uh, we've got a cohort of about 150 going through from one employer at the moment. And we're also seeing it internationally. Um, so the UK government, together with the government of Kenya, for example, has uh, jointly funded 32 uh, educators from Kenya to come on to a micro credential. So we are seeing various initiatives come into place, but so far these are short term initiatives that nobody can guarantee are going to go forward. But they are very positive signs of what might happen in the future. Okay, and Ulf, is it is it the same in this variety of states in um, Germany as our particular initiatives being rolled out to support micro credential development? Um, am I, yeah. um, yes, we have I think currently three uh, federal uh, projects or initiatives uh, to work on micro credentials and. Um, some within the states, 16 states, we have some within the yeah. states. Um, but I would say that the discussion is currently quite conservative within the institutions okay. uh, and also on the on the federal level. Um, but I expect that it's going to, to take up uh, much more when uh, Europe is uh, developing more and more tools and initiatives in this direction. And we're getting to the point now where we're expecting some outputs to come from the Commission with respect to a resolution. With respect, we've had the open consultation process. We've had the working definition of micro credentials. So we have the European roadmap delivering out. So there's some there's some steps to move forward in the coming few months that we should expect some more movement on micro credentials. Before I wrap up, I'm going to ask each one of the panelists to give. There one piece of advice to anyone who wants to get involved in micro credentials or potentially to learn more about it if they want to um, do that. I'll start off with yourself, Deborah. Oh, I put something in the chat saying have a look at the Echo website and, and get in touch. Um, obviously, looking at uh, uh, micro credentials from the point of view of the of the artifacts, but also um, asking the big questions. Um, I think I shared earlier as well the uh, this, the Madrid statement from the um, Eden annual conference. So uh, my piece of advice would be to read that and get in touch and uh, continue the conversation. Thank you. Rebecca? I think my advice would be to talk to people who've already done this um, and talk to the people who are doing uh, the work around it. Uh, Mark has, has shared a really good link in the chat here to uh, the MOOC observ uh, the, the, well, the observatory that's, that's picking up on all this. Um, so there are places you can go to find this, this information together. Um, I'd also say, bear in mind that this is something which you probably need to do at scale. It's very difficult for a small team to introduce micro-credentials. Um, it's probably going to be a university-wide initiative. So take that into account from the beginning. Okay. Ulf? I also would like to, to, to emphasize that, that it's a total systems thing, you know, that um, probably micro-credential will take up when the systems are tuned towards it. Um, and in, in that regard, I would like to end with inviting um, everybody who's interested to have a look at the scenario work which we did, um, which is uh, trying to map out um, scenarios in which micro-credentials in a higher education future um, have a relevant, a very, very relevant role to play um, as a key to unlocking the flexibility. But there's still a lot of work to be done until we reach that. Um, uh, and that's uh, for the quality, for the assessment, uh, for the verification also, the portability. How do you, you know, take it with you? Uh, so that's our task, our all common together task, not <laughs> which we are working on that. Um, and I'm looking forward to that because I think it holds a lot of promise. Well, you're right there. They're definitely it is a global task. And I think if you we we did a massive piece of work over the summer in DCU, myself, Mark, and our team, Elaine and Kroher, 
And we did a huge amount of a review on the micro-credential literature. And it's a global phenomenon, you know, it's quite all around. So I think very much we're in this together. We have a huge amount of work that's happening in Europe um, with respect to our roadmap and everything that has gone on with that. As um, Mark, I think, has put into the chat, please go to the DCU Micro-Credential Observatory. We're trying to curate a lot of resources there. Deborah and Rebecca and Elf have also put in some links which will be useful. I hope this has been of some use to um, those of you who are um, an interest in micro-credentials. We will have further webinars on micro-credentials and I suppose all it is left for me to do is to thank Eden for providing us with the platform to talk a little bit about micro-credentials today. And I wish you all a very good week. And for those of us who are on our last of bank holiday in Ireland to enjoy the end of the bank holiday. Thank you very much, Sloan.